Hi everyone. Welcome to Chapter 16's lecture. Today we're going to focus on our last financial statement that we mentioned in Chapter 1, but said, well, we really can't learn it yet because we need to learn a lot more about accounting before we could really tackle it. Well, the time has come. So we are in Chapter 16, and what you see in front of you is what the statement looks like, the statement of cash flow. Now this is in your book. Um, it is on page 581. So before we get into the PowerPoint, I wanted to just take a little look with you at it so we can get familiar with it and you might want to keep your book open to this page. The statement of cash flow generally tells a decision maker how a company spent their cash. So Let's see, sorry, I just want to make sure everything's okay with recording. Okay, um, so all companies have three major types of activities in their business. The first is operating activities, the second are investing activities, and the third are financing activities. So, what the statement of cash flow does is tells decision makers if the company made more money than they spent or spent more money than they made from their major operating activities. So we're going to show you how we and what the heck this is. But that's what's ultimately being reported. And you could see this company has reported positive cash from their operating activities. Then we tackle investing activities. Companies must invest in assets in order to operate their business every day. So any kind of purchase or sale of long-term assets are generally reported in this area. And then companies must finance their business to purchase assets. So we're focused on cash activity related to borrowing money on like in a no payable, excuse me, or bond situation or any kind of equity transactions re involving cash. So you can see this company's financing activities involve issuing stock, paying off some notes payable, and paying some dividends. So we group those cash flows in and out, money coming in or money being spent by those activities, and then we determine overall this cash had positive cash from operating activities. They had a positive cash from their investing activities and negative cash from their financing activities. And then the details explain why. Then they net those three numbers together to determine how cash changed overall from the year. So we need to know where cash started and where it ended. And we get that information from the balance sheet. So if you go to your page, let me grab it here, this company's um, balance sheet, Genesis, is in chapter 16, near the beginning of the chapter, on page 574. And it shows their cash balance at the end of 2018 was 12,000, but by the end of 2019, it's 17,000. So the balance sheet just shows how how much it changed by. The statement of cash flow tells you why. And that's why this statement is so important. So I'm going to stop sharing my book. Okay, just give me a second. Find my mouse. Okay. And I'm going to go back now to my PowerPoint and let's get into the discussion of this chapter. So that's our focus. So today we'll be distinguishing between what are operating, in, investing, and financing activities? What exactly are they? And what's this thing? There's something called non-cash investing and financing activities. Um, we're going to go through the procedural part. Actually prepare a statement of cash flows. Compute cash flows from operating activities using what's called the indirect method. Determine cash flows from both investing and financing activities. So we're going to get into the nitty gritty of how we determine that. 
we're not going to do the appendix A or B. You're welcome to look at them, but we're not going to be responsible for them. So what is the purpose of this? Again, we touched on it already. How does a company receive its cash? How, why do income and cash flows differ? What explains the change in cash balance? Where does the company spend its money? So it's answering these basic questions for decision makers. Now, users decide if a company has cash to pay its debts. So is the company making enough from its operations to pay off its debts? It helps users evaluate company's ability to pursue unexpected opportunities. Managers can plan from the day-to-day -day operations using the statement of cash flow, and managers can make long-term investment decisions. So it's more than just telling people how we spend our cash, but we're actually using this to help us um, make decisions about activities within the company. Now, remember, and I think we've mentioned this in a prior chapter, when it comes to cash flow in a company, we just don't report the cash in a checking account as cash. We usually also include in our balance of cash something called cash equivalents. And these are items that are not in pure cash form. So they're not in your checking account, but they're very, very short term, highly liquid investments. You can convert them to cash instantly. They're readily convertible into cash and they mature really fast. Weeks, couple weeks, not that long. So if we have any investments in these types of, in this type of category with these characteristics, we usually add them to our cash balance. So when you see that twelve and seventeen thousand dollars, no, that's just not the amount in their savings or checking account. But they also may be in these really high liquid investments, certificates of deposits, that are going to um, mature really quick. So let's now get into. We know the why. We know what it's supposed to do. We've seen it. Now we're going to start distinguishing between what is considered an operating or an investing or a financing activity. And what's this thing, non-cash investing in financing? So you saw on the statement of cash flow, it's broken down into three major sections. So first we're going to collect cash flow information from operating activities. And generally, you can look at operating activities as the money coming in and out from us just doing our core business day in and day out. Then there's the investing activities area. That's going to focus on our purchase and sale of investments, things like long-term assets. So what's our cash flow from purchasing and selling investments, long-term investments, property, plants, and equipment, and intangible assets. So do we have positive cash or negative cash? And then the final section is financing activities. We talked about this already. That's where we'll show how cash changed from borrowing money or paying off loans, or cash inflows or outflows from our equity activities. So here's your operating. That's a great little picture flowchart. So you could think of cash coming in from operating activities as the sales we make for cash. Also the receipt of dividends are, so if we have any investments that pay us dividend and we record dividend revenue, that's considered part of operating activities. I know people will um, debate that it's an investment activity, but the FASB has made the decision that should be considered in operations. Same with interest revenue. So if we have any kind of loan note receivables, so loans to others that we have interest revenue on, that revenue, that cash we receive on the interest is included as operating inflow of cash, money coming in. And then collections on account, on credit sales, these are also 
cash inflows from operations. Now, what are considered operating activities? Well, the major ones are your expenses, all those operating expenses you pay, the taxes and fines that you pay, any interest you have to pay because you have borrowed money, supplies you have to pay for, for your inventory or other goods and services, um, salaries and wages. So any outflows from those normal everyday operating expenses of cash, and that's the key. See, we, when people get to this chapter, I know I did, I was like, whoa, wait a second. I thought we were doing accrual accounting. We are. And that's why it's weird, especially for us to create this cash flow statement, because now we've got to tell people about cash inflows and outflows. We're not used to that. We're telling, we're used to telling them about activity. Hey, we earned revenue or hey, we had an expense, an expense occur here. We don't focus over our first two semesters on when was the cash paid. In this chapter, we do. Now, here are some common items that are inflows and outflows from investing activities. You sell an intangible asset, like a copyright, or you sell a trademark, or you sell a patent, or you sell um, a licensing agreement that was on your intangible area. So you get cash inflow from that. You get cash from selling a long-term investment. Maybe you had an investment in stocks or bonds that you sold. Even short-term investments are accounted for here. So if you have any debt investments that are in the trading category and you sell it, the proceeds from that sale is considered an inflow. It's reported as an investing activity. If you sell a note receivable, the, in, the cash you receive is considered an inflow from investing activity. If you sell a plant asset, if you collect on a notes receivable, the principal portion is considered an inflow from investing activity. Now that's the key, it's the principal that you collect. Any interest you collect is considered an operating activity. And we talked about that already. So we, really you're focused on your long-term assets and short-term investments. Did I buy any? Did I sell any? If I sold any, how much money did I receive on the day of the sale? That is an inflow from an investing activity. Now, if you buy them, that's an outflow from an investing activity. So anytime we buy a plant asset, the cash we paid is considered an outflow from an investing activity. Same with intangible assets. Or if we loan money, remember, we can loan money out. We could buy short-term or long-term investments. So anytime cash is involved in these types of transactions, they will be shown in this area as either coming in a cash inflow or going out, cash outflow. And the final inflows and outflows, financing activities. So when would you have an inflow of cash from a financing activity? Well, here we're focused on cash inflows and outflows from borrowing money, so your long-term liability or your short-term notes payable, and equity transactions. So anytime you sell common or preferred stock for cash, that's an inflow from financing activity. When you sell treasury stock back into the market, inflow. When you borrow more money, whether it's more notes or bonds, inflow. And if there's contributions from the owners at any time, so we're focused on corporations now because that was the last type of entity we looked at. But what if you're doing a cash flow statement for a sole proprietor or partnership? So whenever the owner provides more money into the company, that's an inflow from financing activity. What are some common outflows? When the company pays dividends or a withdrawal is taken by the owner. When the company purchases treasury stock, outflow because they're using cash. When the company pays off their short or long-term notes or bonds payable, the money they pay out is a decrease or outflow from a financing activity. Okay, so 
if you go back to page 574 of your book, you can see each of these areas have dealt with our income statement and our balance sheet and all the accounts. Because remember, where are all of our accounts appearing from our general ledger? All of our activity, they're either on the income statement or they end up on the balance sheet. Now, one final item, it's called a non-cash investing and financing activity. What are these? These are material um, purchases, sales, or payoffs that don't involve cash. And they usually occur in the investing and financing areas of our company. Here are some examples. We pay off debt with issuing stock. So we didn't pay off our debt using cash, we issued stock instead. We converted preferred stock to common stock. No cash is involved in that, but it's a major activity. We lease an asset. Don't worry about that one too much. We didn't talk about leases, but we purchased a long-term asset by issuing a note. So we bought equipment with a loan. There's no cash in that. Cash, cash account wasn't debited or credited at all. We purchase a non-cash asset by issuing equity or debt. So we purchase um, a building for common stock. These types of activities are important and need to be reported, but they're not reported directly on the statement of cash flow to get to your cash balance like we saw on the statement of cash flow. They're actually added at the very, very end of the statement of cash flow. So they do appear on the statement of cash flow. We don't ignore them, but they're not part of the reporting. They're not in operating, they're not in financing, they're not in investing. They're at the very bottom of the page. And we say, oh, by the way, we had some other activity that didn't involve cash. And we label it non-cash investing and financing and we report it. And if it's not reported there, it would be in the notes to the financial statements. But we do need to let decision makers know about this. Okay, so those are our sections. That's what we're reporting. Let's start making this. Let's prepare a statement of cash flow. So there's the general outline. This is on page um, the bottom of page 571. Okay. Oh. Okay. Sorry, I was reading something. Um, the bottom of six of page 571. So you could follow that along. Um, and as it says, any any non-cash investing and financing may be on a separate schedule or note disclosure. And that's what I was just talking about a few seconds ago. Now, there are steps we do to report the information on the statement of cash flow. So the first step is we're going to compute net increase or decrease in cash, of course. First, we're going to look at the net increase or decrease from operating activities, then investing activities, then financing activities, and then we net those three amounts, two, three, and four together, add it to the beginning balance, and determine if, we're, if our ending balance on our statement of cash flow agrees with our ending cash balance on our balance sheet. So they have to agree. Now, what's normal for people, and I know when I was learning this, I went, I'll just go to the cash account and pick apart every transaction in the cash account. Well, that's, that's really easy to do if you have like 10 transactions, like you see there, right? <laughs> but that's not normal. Companies don't have 10 transactions in their cash account. So we have an easier way of creating a statement of cash flow than looking through and trying to figure out What's an investing activity? What's an operating activity? What's, an, what's a financing activity? Now, how do we do it? We're gonna use all the other accounts and analyze all the other accounts to determine 
how cash changed. So you could think of it, and I really like this formula. Cash equals liabilities plus equity minus non-cash assets. But don't they? Think about it. Cash plus non-cash assets equal liabilities plus equity. So if we change our formula around a little bit algebraically, that holds true. So we will use our balance sheet and our income statement, and maybe we'll need some additional information that maybe we can't see on these to prepare a statement of cash flow. And you would be given all that in a problem. Now, they show you cash flows from operations. And the beautiful thing about cash flows from operating activities is the FASB has given us two different ways to create this section of the statement of cash flow. So you don't, you're not stuck doing it one way. Now, the first way they show you there is called the direct method. And it's called the direct method because we come right out and tell people, here's the money we got from our operating activities, cash from our customers, there it is. Cash we paid for our inventory, there it is. Cash we paid for salaries and other operating expenses. Cash we pay for interest, cash we paid for taxes. You can't question where they spent their cash because it's direct. It's very easy for a non-business person to understand that. So they give us that option. The thing is, is that it's a pain in the neck to figure that out from an accountant's perspective. So only about 1% of accountants use that method. 99% of companies do the other method. It's called the indirect method. And although it makes sense to a person who knows accounting, it's kind of indirect to get to what we're trying to find out. Did we have positive cash from operating activities or negative cash? Now, because 99% of companies use it, that's what you're going to learn. If you are an accounting major, when you take your next set of accounting courses, you learn both methods. But since a lot of you aren't accounting majors, you just need to know this so that you understand what the heck it is when you see one of these come across your desk and what it's telling you. Um, we're going to learn the indirect method of preparing cash flows from operations. Now, what are we doing? You could see there, it says, start with net income. And then we add and subtract all these things. Generally, here's what we're doing. We're converting net income that's created from an accrual basis approach. Remember, accrual accounting says report revenue when it's earned, report expenses when they occur, not when you receive the cash or when you pay the cash, no. But net income is a great place to start to determine how well we did in our operations because that's our profit for the period. It's just that it's not in the proper format for this financial statement because we want to report how much cash inflow or outflow there was from operations, not the activity. So what we do in the indirect method is we transform net income from an accrual basis into net income on a cash basis. So if we did report cash in, cash in our accounting records, or I should say, if we only reported revenue when we received cash from customers and we only reported expenses when we actually paid them, our net income would have been $20,000. So that stuff in between is pulling out and adding in non-cash items that aren't properly reported in accrual net income to get to cash net income. And that's what we're doing there. Maybe we actually spent more in expenses than is on. So we paid for more expenses than are on our income statement because they're from last year. Or maybe we received more cash than our actual sales this year. So we'll account for all of that during this process. So let's do it. So there is our income statement and our balance sheet. So have that in front of you. That's what we'll be using. You could see here, 
your author already took the time, which by the way, normally a company will report on their balance sheet and their income statement and all their financial statements, two separate years worth of information. Sometimes they report even more to compare. So this is normal. You will see 2018 and 2019's balance sheet information on a financial statement in the real world. So the first thing that we usually do is we go through each item on our balance sheet and we determine, did it increase or decrease during the year? So you could look at 2018's balance as the beginning of 2019. So from the beginning of 2019 to the end of 2019, cash increased 5,000. Accounts receivables increased 20,000. Inventory increased 14,000. And our prepaid expenses increased 2,000. So you have to do that calculation. Then go down to your long-term assets. How do they change? How did your liabilities change and your equity? So that's really your first step. Now, once you have those changes, now let's create the statement of cash flow. We always start, and this is common standard language, cash flows from operating activities. So put that label, because that's the section we're going to complete. You start with net income. That comes right off of your income statement. Remember, we're converting that from accrual basis to cash basis. Now, here is our first step. We need to identify items on the income statement that either have no cash involved in them at all. And here's your, your one, depreciation expense. Depreciation expense, you never debit or credit cash for that. You subtract it to get to net income in accrual accounting, but in cash accounting, you would have never subtracted it because it, you don't pay for it. So the first thing we do with depreciation expense is add it back. If we're transforming net income into net cash flow, it should have never been subtracted. That's always your first step. And all companies have depreciation. The other items on the income statement that need to either be added or subtracted. Any gain or loss on investments. So if you have a gain on the retirement of notes here, you should have never added that to operating income because it has nothing to do with operations. It has to do with investing. You account for that $16,000 gain, but not in this section of the statement of cash flow. So we have to subtract it from our net income because it should have never been reported in this area. So transforming net income into net cash flow. If gain on retirement of notes is a cash flow from investing activities, it should have never been added to get to our net income, subtract it. Same if there's any losses, and we do, we have a loss on the sale of plant assets, again, a loss shouldn't have been subtracted from to, to determine operating cash flow, add it back. So we're really nulling out or washing out the effects of the gain and loss on the net income where we started. The same with depreciation expense, add it back. So those are your common items, gains or losses on investment activity assets and depreciation. First step. So go to that income statement, find those items, add or subtract them accordingly. Depreciation is added, losses are added, gains are subtracted. We're done with the income statement. All other items on our income statement will have some portion of the account where cash was either debited or credited. Think about it, sales. Some of your sales were for cash cost of goods sold, we'll deal inventory. We bought some of that. Wages, most of that is probably paid in cash. Interest expense, same deal. Okay, so all of our major expenses on here, same with income taxes, there's some cash involved. Some may have accrual on them, meaning the cash wasn't paid yet, 
but some of it was involved with cash. So the second part of the statement of this part of the statement is to pull out any part of the expense that hasn't been paid or add in any part um, that has been and the same with our revenue. Pull out the part that hasn't been received or add in an amount above sales that was. Now, how do we do that? Well, we use the assets that are created from our operations, current assets and, long, and current liabilities. Current assets and current liabilities. Which current assets? Well, all of them except for short-term investments. This company has no short-term investments. So we go to accounts receivable. Now you have to think about this. Accounts receivables goes from a balance of 40,000 to a balance of 60,000. So over the year, it increased 20,000. And that's true. So we write increase in accounts receivable. But then we have to write what was the impact on cash? If accounts receivables increased by 20,000, that means we collected 20,000 less in cash from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. You could almost think of it as, what would I have done? I would have debited accounts receivable, do the opposite to cash. So overall, the impact on cash is a decrease because accounts receivables went up during the year. Inventory, it went from a balance from 70 up to 84. So you could look at that as we increased or bought more inventory, 14,000. Well, what would have been the impact on cash? It would have decreased. If you buy more inventory, you would have spent more cash. So we show this as a decrease. Prepaid expenses, same deal. It goes from a balance of 4,000 to 6,000. We paid more for our prepaid expenses. So although we say increase in these items, yes, the asset account increased, but we're reporting on here, when that asset increased, what happens to cash? It decreases. So whenever an asset increases from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, the impact is negative on cash flow and vice versa. If the asset decreased from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, it would increase cash flow. So you can look at that as an opposite effect. Those are all the current assets. Let's go down to current liabilities. We have three of them. Accounts payable. Accounts payable goes from a balance of 40,000 down to 35 or it decreases. Now think of it this way. If a liability decreases, that means we paid more for it. So we write decrease in accounts payable. Well, what's the impact on cash when accounts payable decreases? Cash also decreases because we paid on that liability. Interest payable, it goes from a $4,000 balance down to a $3,000 balance. It changes by 1,000. So we paid more on that liability. So the impact on cash is a decrease. Income taxes, though, go from 12000 up to 22000 So they increase. So that's, we didn't pay for that yet. So that increase in the current liability impacts our cash by making it positive 10000 So when it comes to current liabilities, the way it changes is direct. If it, if it increases the current liability, cash increases. If it decreases, the impact on cash flow in this area is a decrease. Okay, so those are all the current assets and current liabilities that would be affecting operations. So now we add those all up and subtract them. Add the 38 to the 24 to the six, subtract the 16, subtract the 20, the 14, the two, the five and the one, and add the 10,000. You've just converted net income accrual basis to net income cash basis. But we don't call it that, we call it net cash provided by operating activities. And we say provided because it's positive. So let's go through it one more time. First, we need to 
add or subtract any expenses or losses, revenues or gains that don't have impact on cash at all or don't impact cash from operations. Again, and we write that. Net income is where we start. Then we put adjustments to reconcile net income to net cash provided by operating activities. Income statement items, not affecting cash in this area. Depreciation expense, add back. And remember losses and gains on your investing activities, long-term asset sales, or also any gain on retirement of notes, okay? Then, that's a cute little table there, change in account balance. So if it increases a current asset, it's a decrease and we subtract it from net income to change net income to net cash flow and vice versa. And then there's our current liabilities. So if you use that table, just make sure you know how your current assets and current liabilities changed. Again, just to reiterate one more time, and there is that section. So first start with the income statement, then go to the balance sheet. That's also a great um, guide for you to complete the um, operating section indirect method for the statement of cash flow. And um, that is on page 576. Okay, that's the hard part. Okay, so make sure you post any kind of questions. I know that's kind of weird and you're sitting there trying to figure out, but you have to think about it a little bit. Uh, remember, all of these assets and liabilities we just looked at have some relationship with some account on the income statement. So if you want to look at it this way, sales is reported at 590000 And that's how much we included in net income. But accounts receivables increased. So did we really collect all $590,000 in cash? No, 20,000 of it is still owed because accounts receivable increased. So we subtract that to correct the sales so that it's really cash flow from sales. Do the same thing with inventory and prepaid expenses, okay? So if you think about it from that perspective, then it makes more sense on why current assets and current liabilities are used in that portion of the cash flow statement. And, then, and when we do the direct method, that's actually what we have to do. We have to remember all those relationships with the accounts and the income statement and dive into the detail and modify them to report, hey, here's how much sales we got in cash. Hey, here's how much we paid for our inventory and operating expenses. Just takes more time. Now, let's go to investing and financing activities. Three processes, three-step process to determine cash provided or used by investing activities. So the first thing we want to know is what kind of changes happened in these accounts? We could reconstruct the T accounts if we don't have them and then report their cash flow. So take a look. Usually as an accountant, we're just using our balance sheet and our income statement. So we go, okay, what accounts are involved with the investing area? Long-term assets, so plant assets, intangible assets, and investments. Well, this company only has plant assets. Their plant assets go from 210,000 to 250,000. So be careful, don't, just don't go, oh, they increased by 40,000. Oh, their cash flow is 40,000. That may or may not be true. We also wanna take a look at what happened to accumulated depreciation. So accumulated depreciation goes from 48,000 to 60,000. So it increased $12,000. Okay. So you do T accounts. Now let's, let's try to reconstruct that. 
oh, we have additional information. In item B, it says the company purchased 60,000 in plan assets by issuing 60,000 of notes payable. So part of the increase, that 40,000 increase, is from buying 60,000 in more assets. Well, doesn't that just blow your theory out of the water? So you have to be careful of this stuff. So if we made a journal entry just to reconstruct that piece of information, we would have increased plant assets 60,000. That's a non-cash investing and financing item, guys. It has nothing to do with cash. Take a look at the next one. Item C said, oh, by, by the way, during the year we sold some plant assets. They have a book value of 8,000. The original cost was 20 and the accumulated depreciation so far is 12. For $2,000 cash, we had a loss of six grand. So what would have been the journal entry the day that we sold these? We would have credited plant assets for their cost, 20 grand debited the accumulated depreciation for 12 grand, debited cash for two grand, and debited a loss on sale of plant assets. Also, they don't come out and tell us this, but I know from looking in the income statement, they debited depreciation expense during the year 24,000 and credited accumulated depreciation. So we, we, we do need to dive into these accounts so that we could pull out how much was cash inflow from plant assets, how much was cash outflow, and is any of the change due to something that has nothing to do with cash, like we saw here. So if you do the T accounts, plant assets started at 210,000. They purchased 60,000 more, not with cash though, they sold 20,000 of the cost. So that's why plant assets increased. Depreciation also changed during the year. It started at a $48,000 balance. It increased by 24,000, but that sale decreased it by 12,000. So that makes sense. So we've proved why the balance has changed. Now we've got to see why they changed because of cash. And the only reason cash or any time cash was involved was the $2,000 they received when they sold them. So we just don't say plant assets changed by 40,000. That's how much cash I used. You've got to see why. So they changed because we sold cash or we sold an asset and received cash from investing activities of 2,000 and the other change was caused from a non-cash investing and financing activity. Nothing to do with cash. So when we report this, if you go ahead back over to, what page do we have that on? Um, page 581. And look, cash flows from investing activities. Cash received from the sale of plant assets, 2000 so maybe the asset account changed by 40 grand, but we only need to know what impact did that change have on cash. It increased cash two grand. We do the same thing with our financing area. A little bit more accounts involved, but it's a three-step process. We need to determine was cash provided or used by financing activities. So we need to find the accounts on our balance sheet that impact the financing area. Remember, it's our notes payable, bonds payable, and our equity area. Explain these changes um, in, the, in these types of accounts and then determine how cash changed because of these items. So if you go back to page 574, let's start with long-term notes payable. It increased, it went from 64,000 up to 90,000. But we just don't say we borrow $26,000 more in cash. Same with common stock, it increased. Whoops, okay, before we go to common stock, let's go to step two with our notes. We may need some more information here, let's find out. Remember, we already know one change, and I'll bring it up in a second. From part B, we know notes payable increased by 60,000 because we bought equipment with it. But also, 
we retired in part E. We retired $34,000 of notes payable, paid them off. We paid $18,000 cash to retire them and we had a $16,000 gain. Now, make sure you know where these are coming from. Up on our income statement, remember we had gain on retirement of notes. Okay. So we know that happened. So when you see that, you got to kind of track, look for it. That would have been the journal entry that occurred that day. We would have debited notes payable 34,000, credited cash. We would have decreased cash only 18,000 of it. The remaining is a gain. So what does our T account look like? Well, it started at a $64,000 balance. It increased during the year because of that non-cash, that purchase of the of um, plant asset with a note and it decreased because we paid off 34,000 of the notes payable. So we've accounted for why the balance changed and the only item that impacted cash, which was in a negative way, was paying off or retiring those notes. That's it. So when we start our cash flow from financing activities, we just show the only impact on cash from a long-term debt was paying 18,000 to retire notes payable. Now we do the same um, process with our equity accounts. First, why did common stock change? Well, it increased. And it tells us in part D that during the year, the company received $15,000 cash from selling common stock. Well, it just so happens that's how much common stock increased by. So that whole increase to common stock was cash related. So the impact on our financing activity is cash received from issuing stock. There was no non-cash element of that increase. Retained earnings also changed. It increased 24,000. Why? You have to remember what increases and decreases retained earnings. During the year, so we start with an $88,000 balance. At the end of the year, we would have added 38,000 to it. So if nothing else happened in retained earnings, we would have $126,000 balance in it. But they tell us in part F, the company declared and paid cash dividends of 14,000. That would have decreased retained earnings by 14,000, leading it to its balance of 112,000. Net income is in cash. Cash dividends paid is. So the only cash component of the retained earnings change is from paying cash dividends. See how we're pulling out the part of these accounts where cash is affected. So when we're done, with the financing area, which you could probably get a better picture of it over on page 581, take a look. Cash flow from financing activities. We received cash from issuing stock. We paid cash to retire notes. We paid cash for dividends. So once we've completed that part, if you look back to that balance sheet we have on page 574, we've accounted for all the changes in all of the assets and picked out the parts that affected cash. We've done it for all the liabilities and all the parts of equity. So once we do that, we are done with the statement of cash flows as far as the analysis goes. Now we want to make sure we know the overall impact of each category. When cash increases in a category, we say provided. So net cash provided by operating activities is 20,000. Net cash provided by investing activities is 2,000. But when it's negative, we say used. Net cash used in financing activities because those three items that affected cash in our financing activities turn out to be net to a negative 17,000. Now we net the 20,000 plus the 2,000 minus the 17,000. This shows us an overall increase or decrease to cash for the year. So net increase in cash is $5,000. Now let's wrap this up. 
What do we do with that? We add it to the beginning balance of cash. We know the beginning balance of cash because it's on our balance sheet. Cash starts with a $12,000 balance. We add the 5,000 we determine in our statement of cash flow. We will then report the cash balance at year end, 17,000. It agrees to the amount on our balance sheet. We're almost done. Okay, so that is how we complete a statement of cash flow. Do it in steps. First, your operating activities, then your investing, and then your financing. Now, if you wanted to have a lot of fun with this, you can see, um, you can use T accounts for all of those items as they do in this slide. And this is also on the bottom of page 582 to help you really see what's happening here. But that's if you'd like to. Also in Appendix A, some people like to use spreadsheets to account for these changes. If you're interested in looking at that, go for it. Because sometimes it's hard to grasp what's happening um, and what you're doing because we're so used to looking at our financial information from an activities perspective rather than a cash perspective. So again, in part one on our cash account um, or in our cash the cash account that they're showing you on this slide, they're actually showing net income as an increase. Well, it is an increase from operating activity. Then we add and subtract the things that have nothing to do with cash to get net cash provided by operations. Then we add and subtract the items for investing and financing that are only cash related. So it kind of shows you how it all fits together in, and, and that you really are accounting for all activity related to cash. So how do managers use this? We review this for business decisions. Take a look. Um, this company, it could be three companies. They're all in the same industry. One has, two have cash provided by operations. One, one has negative. Um, one has positive cash from investing, two have negative. One has negative cash from financing, one doesn't have anything from financing, and one has positive cash from financing. So it really helps us to start evaluating how companies in our industry are using their cash, and they talk about this over on page 583. Creditors will use this to evaluate a company's ability to generate enough cash to pay their debt. They're really looking at that operating cash flow. And investors are going to use it to see, hey, are we getting money out of operations to maybe pay a dividend, buy and sell stock? Okay, so it's giving us a lot of information on how the company manages cash. Now, this um, cash flow and total assets, we will be covering this in our next chapter. Okay, so I thought I deleted this slide, but it's there. So like I said, there are um, appendix in here. You are, it would be great if you are, especially if you're an accounting major to look at how to prepare this operating cash flow section from the direct method. You're not responsible for it otherwise. And then there's a spreadsheet in there as well. So the statement of cash flow. So please post any kind of questions you may have to the discussion board.